Okay, welcome everyone to this panel and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, just make sure that your mics are muted because we're recording. Um, so we're very excited, we're hosting as the OFN um, and we just launched a new campaign around food equity and a new series of events. And this is our first one this year. And um, if you don't already know who we are with the Open Food Network, we're a nonprofit cooperative that exists to enable healthy and connected communities to build a more resilient and diverse secure food system that nourishes everybody and regenerates the planet. Uh, our flagship project is an open source e-commerce platform tailored specifically to community food enterprises and local food producers. Uh, but we're not just a platform, we're also a network and we create shared resources to facilitate our community to uh, into learning opportunities and host events like this one uh, and to contribute valuable research to build the evidence base for short supply chains and community driven food systems and much more. We've been thinking a lot uh, in the past few months about food equity, because with the cost of living crisis, um, it's been very hard for food enterprises as well as individuals. And we've been seeing a lot of amazing work done by our community uh, from the food enterprises, growers, farmers, and the members of our teams as well. And we really wanted to highlight that um, through this series event and especially for our first one. And we're very excited because we have amazing panelists tonight that are going to talk about the work that they've been doing. And hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end. Um, so a bit of housekeeping. This is recorded. So if you're not comfortable, you can keep your camera off or you can email us afterwards uh, if you don't want to be in it. And yes, please keep your mics muted. And yeah, I think we can get started. Um, so I'm gonna let the panelists introduce themselves and um, I'm gonna start with the first question and I'll ask it to Sarah first uh, and then we'll get to the next ones. Can you please introduce yourself and tell us what's motivated you to address food poverty uh, in the UK, Sarah? Uh, hi, I'm uh, welcome this evening. I'm sorry, I've had a I guess I've had a very long day, so you've caught me on the tail end. So uh, I'm going to try and maintain my energy, but I am also a pretty pretty worked out. But anyway, I'm the programs director at Sustain. We're the Alliance for Better Food and Farming. Um, Open Food Network are one of our hundred uh, alliance members, and we have many more people and networks that we work with across the UK. Um, um, I'll try and keep it fairly brief. I suppose there's sort of many answers to that. There's the the personal motivation and there's the organisational motivation. Um, personally, I've been working around community regen um, and in the areas of food access for very many years. Um, and I suppose that comes from uh, equity and equity and fairness point of view, that the, the sort of basis, basic value that everybody has a right um, to access good food. Um, organisationally, I suppose that feeds into sustain, which where we believe that, that uh, we should have a food and farming system that's better for people and better for planet. Um, and um, I'll talk a bit more about uh, about bridging the gap and how that factors in. But at the moment, um, yeah, it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like uh, good food is crossing the divide into food access so it feels like there's a bit of a, a gap in the movement between those working for sustainable food and those working for um, food access and food equity is that enough I don't know how much of an intro you wanted me to give no that was that was great thank you so much Sarah um, and I'm gonna pass it on to Simon thank you good evening uh, I'm Simon Platten I'm a director of Tamar Grow Local 
and um, where to begin. I, I get five minutes later on to, to give a, a fuller talk, but um, Tamogra Local is a community interest company that was set up in 2007. Uh, primarily to increase the food security of our, our local communities. So from a, an operational perspective, um, food equity is, is kind of at the heart of why we, why we were set up in the way we were. The uh, first few years of uh, our organisation were to set up a number of community food initiatives. And then we really got involved in food equity after being contacted by a really quite inspirational housing association, Plymouth Community Homes to see if we could uh, work with them to, to help uh, increase the amount of fruit and vegetables consumed by their tenants. And then our work has really led from there and I'll get to talk a bit more about that later on. Thank you so much, Simon. And um, I'll pass it to Kate. Hi, I'm, I'm Kate. Um, I was formerly with Kent Free Shops Frankston. Um, I live there this last year and I'm now um, I'm non-executive director of the Open Food Network. Um, I'm a director with Custom Food Lab and I, I run with my um, one of my co-directors, a community garden here in Folkestone. Um, in Folkestone we've got this huge disparity between East and West. I think the average house price here is about 350,000 but we're something like the we're in the top 10% of the um, deprivation index so that kind of shows you how skewed it is um, here the people that don't have much really really don't have much and in terms of food equity um, I believe really really strongly that food is at the heart of the community if, if we take away our ability to grow to have culturally appropriate food to share that knowledge of growing cooking between generations cultures community it just dismantles everything. And particularly within a cost of living crisis, it isn't really anybody's fault that we're losing that. Um, and I just believe really strongly that, that it should become, it, it should return back to being community-based and localized. So um, I'm part of a group that's setting up called Feeding Folkestone, um, uniting all the growing groups and food-based initiatives around this area and hopefully handing back some autonomy and, and agency to, to everybody here. Um, and yeah, I, I feel a bit like our food systems have been stolen. So that's what we're doing here, sort of fighting the power and trying to trying to bring it back. Thank you, Kate. That's really interesting and inspiring. Um, and I'll pass to Angelina. Hi there, I'm Angelina Sanderson Bellamy. I'm an associate professor of food systems at University of the West of England, Bristol. And I got into this originally through a research project that I ran from 2019 to 2021 um, called Tea Grains. And with that project, we we're looking at how do you transform the food system to be healthier and more sustainable. And the main hypothesis that we're looking at is what happens when you build relationships back into the food system. Um, understanding that the last 50, 60 years, we've seen longer and longer supply chains, sort of globalized food supply chains, and people becoming more and more disconnected with where their food comes from. So we had looked at uh, new members of CSA veg bag schemes to look at the impact of the relationship. And what we found was that for those people who'd recently joined a veg bag scheme, they their diets, they were consuming more vegetables and more legumes, less meat, less dairy, less fats, and less sugar. And overall, their diets had about a 30% lower carbon emission compared to the average UK household. Um, so that was really quite exciting outcomes because it showed that there is there is an appetite for changing diets in the UK that can move us more towards our net zero targets. But then it was the realis it was the recognition that uh, veg bag schemes typically tend to be a white middle class phenomenon, and it is more proportionately represented among higher income households. So. If, if thinking about our sustainability targets, net zero targets, if the majority of the population can't actually afford those diets, then we can we're, we're not going to be able to meet those targets. So I and I mean, for the same reasons that everyone else here has already said, it, it's also right that all people should be able to access healthy, sustainable foods. And so I became interested in looking at 
do these benefits accrue similarly for food insecure households? And how, how might we build sort of solidarity models into these veg bag schemes so that food insecure households could have the same ability to access the food as um, those who are uh, members of CSA veg bag schemes? So that's um, sort of how I got into this piece of work. Thanks, Angelina. Yeah, that's super interesting. And yeah, looking forward to hear more. Um, I'll pass it to Elect Electra. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm really pleased to be here um, among all the different panelists and all people um, that I really admire the work of. Um, and so I guess I've kind of come to this work. I've been working on a market garden um, for the past few years, as well as working in the kind of restaurant um, sector and in private catering. Um, and then more recently, I've been doing quite a bit of work in primary schools, um, helping to run and facilitate workshops related to food and farming. And so I'm kind of really excited about the role that education and imagination plays within all of this. Um, but perhaps more kind of specifically, what brings me to this panel um, is the research that I've been doing for my master's, which I began last year at Schumacher. Um, and broadly speaking, this is research is focused on the gap that exists between kind of sustainable agroecological regenerative farming on the one hand, and then the accessibility of that produce on the other. So kind of really chimes with Angelina's work, um, her, the um, study that you did as well, um, which I've looked into. Um, and this kind of gap seems to be increasingly widening um, as the cost of living crisis gets worse. Um, so I was kind of looking at that by taking a group of projects that was funded by the um, National Lottery Fund through the Land Workers Alliance um, and looking at kind of how grassroots initiatives, uh, what work is going on to narrow that gap. Um, and how kind of policy and that work needs to interact. Um, yeah, so I guess that's kind of briefly how I got into all of this. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, your research sounds really, really interesting. Um, and then lastly, Jade. Hi, yeah, I'm Jade. Um, I work for the Real Farming Trust on a project called Ready Healthy Eat. Oh, we've got to thank. Simon, having a lot to do with having you know, helped that set up in the first place. Uh, so the Real Farming Trust, you'll know if you know about the Oxford Real Farming Conference, that's a conference. We also run a loan scheme called LEAP, um, which you can talk to me about if you want to borrow some money for your food, like community food enterprise. Um, so, yeah, Ready Healthy does ready meals on quite a large scale. We've done coming on towards a million meals so far, delivered by partners across the UK. Um, and then there's also a research element to measure the social impact of the work. Um, I've been doing this kind of work for about 30 years or something like that. So I've done been a little producer. Um, I own and run a brewery. I've worked at sort of UK level quite a long time doing short supply chains or community involvement. I've had a lot to do with um, setting up CSAs. And then I helped set up Stroudco and that began, you know, the Food Network eventually got way out of that work. Um, so. Um, got a few slides actually. I wanted to introduce some of the issues as well, um, which uh, everybody else has brought up quite nicely already, I think. Uh, let me just make it come from the beginning. Slideshow, there we go. I have to go from the beginning. There we go. Um, so, yeah, I want to introduce um, Ben and Dee as well. Look, here they are. Um, so, they came to the project to have some ready meals. Um, and really, I want to introduce them. They should be speaking really in place of me. Um, so I, I just want us to to listen to the rest of the conversation through their eyes. Um, so they're recently married um, and they both came to the project um, and they both got learning difficulties. Um, and so I just kind of wanted to think also about, you know, several of the speakers already talked about the gap. Um, between, you know, the project on the left, who for all the right reasons wants to give um, organic food away to people who can't afford to pay for it themselves, um, and, and Ben and Dee and how that looks through, through their eyes, you <laughs> that gap there that um, 
but already Lecture and Sarah and Simon mentioned. I, and I guess for the rest of this conversation, we have to think about what's in that gap. And it is partly money, but it's not only money. There's also cultural and social issues in there, quite a lot of them. Um, so I think the issues are really thorny and, you know, the other speakers have already referred to some of this, that the, the root problem is policy, which we can't well fix. It's beyond her power, really. Um, so we end up doing sticking plasters that aren't really good enough. And that's that's the best we can do. Um, so, so the works always feels a bit inadequate. We never really get to the root of the problem. Um, and I don't really talk about a cost of living crisis because actually I think a lot of people are not having a cost of living crisis I talk about an inequality crisis um, which is huge and Kate mentioned something similar um, and it's on a vast scale and, and, and also I think maybe um, I don't really talk about food poverty I think it's more about nutrition poverty it's much easier to afford enough calories than to um, afford a nutritious a fully nutritious diet um, and maybe that whole idea of food poverty is really coming from the eyes of a food poverty project or a community food project that when you talk to Ben and Dee about their lives, they don't talk about food poverty. In fact, food isn't top of the list. They have all kinds of interesting and complicated things going on. Um, and, and maybe when they come through the door, there's kind of multiple vulnerabilities. If someone is worried about affording food, that's not top of their list. <laughs> and they walk through the door with all kinds of other stuff. So I, I guess it's important for us to welcome them as whole people with whole lives and to, to not try and um, put them into our box. Um, and I, I think also, you know, when you uh, think about having a really nice box of organic food to give away to be in a D and Ben, you've, you've got to think about who's making the choices that that is going from the people with privilege and choices to the people um, who have fewer choices. And most times we don't really shift that. I think if you ask B and Dan, uh, D and Ben, they'd much rather have the 15 quid that those vegetables cost to produce, but they don't get that choice. So, so I, I think it's good for us to think about it through their lens, all these kind of questions. Um, yeah, and I've, I've just done that picture. Look, there's, uh, there's Emma, she's looking after a single mom, looking after a toddler who's got loads of health problems. She also looks after a mom who's got dementia. And really, the you know, she goes to the project on the left. That's much easier. The gap's smaller um, for her than the project on the right. So, so we've got work to do there. Um, and then I suppose, you know, we're probably all just about to talk about these issues, that there's immediate practical problems as well, that the farmers should get a full price. Um, and most of the projects dealing with food poverty, um, actually, you know, the, the projects we work with, I, I was giving them a bit of grief about why they weren't buying more organic and local food at the beginning. And they said, look, we're not buying food, that, that nearly all the food they're using is actually surplus food. So it's not that they're not buying local organic food, they're not buying food, they're completely dependent on what's coming to them through supply chains that they don't control at all. Um, and then the other really big issue that we're probably all going to talk about is that the um, food traders or food growers um, are not based in the project in, in the communities or led by the communities that we're trying to reach um, and ideally that poverty work is done from and by people who um, are part of that community and, and strong in that community and it's a really skillful job it's really difficult to do and if you're a farmer or a food project you know it's also really difficult growing vegetables. It's very difficult for a food project to do that poverty work really well. So I think that, you know, we've got some really difficult practical projects and we hardly ever see um, a method that actually completely works. <laughs> a lot of the work that I've done and, and, you know, it's a common thing. It's actually not really good enough. I guess that's all I want to say as an introduction. Thank you, Jade. You 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 brought up a lot of points that are very very interesting um but hopefully we can talk more about it in the second question um i just want to remind the audience that uh if you have any questions to add them to the chat just in case because if we don't get to answer them um we're going to be writing a blog with all the questions and um hopefully we can answer them through that um, okay, well, thank you so much for, for your present introductions. They were really interesting. Um, and let's get to question two. Um, and I think I'm going to start with Kate. 
Um, can you tell us about what you've been doing to address food poverty in your community? I mean, I guess you've said a lot already, but yeah. Um, we're quite similar, really, to what Jade just said. Um, we've got a really diverse population here. Um, we, we've set up this group and, and basically what I realised through my work with um, the Food Hub originally was I wanted to get local food on board, locally grown food on board. And there's so many groups in the area, so many community gardens, um, projects. We're all applying for the same pot of money. Um, we've all got the same motivations and it only goes so far. So we started to sort of like collaborate and talk. Um, and ultimately we would like to be, you know, like a patchwork farm really where we're providing for the community. But what I really strongly feel is that we don't want to appropriate the identity or the integrity of any of these growing groups. Um, there are people who, um, very much like Jade said, you know, a community garden, a lot of them are run very much by um, middle class white women, um, older people who are retired. That doesn't necessarily help the problem of food poverty. So we looked at all of all of the groups that are there and decided to come together as a collective, which we've called Feeding Folkestone. Um, Ultimately, we'd like to be kind of like a, a patchwork, almost like a patchwork CSA. So we've got everything in there. But for example, one of one of the, the member groups is Incredible Edible. They've got um, herb planters all along the high street. But if you don't know what to do with those herbs, then you're not going to go and pick them. If you don't know what to do with vegetables, you're not going to go and get the vegetables. So our first project is actually um, was a disco soup, which is basically gleaned excess um, donated food it was all food that was going to be for weight uh, going to waste um, just to gauge really what the community thought about it and we had all sorts of people turn up it was absolutely brilliant I think we fed 150 people with food that would be wasted everybody turns up everybody's involved in preparing the soup there's a DJ everybody dances um, it was just really fun there was apple pressing there was all sorts of things um, it was really really wonderful and then that really kind of like firmed us up so by forming the group together what we're we're aspiring to is to um it gives us more purchase power it gives us higher visibility it provides opportunities for everybody to find something that's right for them for example we are at the moment talking about um we've got we're loosely terming it as a heritage a heritage mm. garden within our community garden the local growing project um, where people can grow produce um, and seeds from um, well from from where they, they think of as home which is like wonderful so that that can be anybody um, coming along we've had we've we've linked in with um, a local um, black women's walking group which is really wonderful they're talking about their connections to the land um, they're a really diverse group and they're going to have a part of the garden so it's actually we're really trying not to take a paternalistic approach of we are providing this for you and you are these other people and we are the people that are, you know, we're really trying to re-establish these links and work within the community that, that's already there. One of the things that we've also set up is a community fridge, um, which again, although it's not growing, it, it is all, um, as Jade said, it, it's all surplus food. A lot of it is, is packaged, but again, I think we've saved something since the end of June last year, it's something insane, like nine tonnes of food that would have been wasted. So it's it, it's actually looking at what people need and what people want. But the, the main aim is to actually not focus just on food poverty, but actually on bringing that community together, um, because that's that's the problem. That's what's missing here. Um, is people othering other people. We've got an excellent emergency um, food system where people can donate tins and donate money, but they're not engaging with the people they're donating these things to. And equally, the people in receipt of them, there, there can be this assumption that, you know, um, that's that's what people want. You Even if you're a great cook, you can't cook if you've got breakfast in a tin, a tin of tuna and some instant mashed potato. You know, you, you can't do it. Um, so it's just about empowering people and, and giving people some agency back in growing their own food. So currently we've, we're talking to two more, but we've, we've got four community gardens on board. Um, 
incredible edible who also grow but it's not a garden it's it's um kind of like a food corridor i suppose you'd call it the community fridge and then there's other initiatives like the community fridge um and we've just received funding for a quarterly um disco soup so that we can bring everybody together and the idea is just to become visible present and actually without this paternalistic approach of we will provide this for you poor people that don't have food actually see what people want work with them um and yeah hopefully create a, a patchwork farm across our community and that's that's where we are at the moment Thanks, Kate. That sounds really exciting. And I really hope it happens soon. And I love how you talk about community. And yeah, it's really great. And um, I'll pass to Jade. Uh, if you want to tell us, I mean, you've told us a lot, but I'm sure you have much more to say about. Uh, yeah, we've done quite a lot of different things in Stroud, as well as, um, of course, in the UK wide project. Um, I think I, I've got this, I, I'm just, I just wanted to sort of highlight this document here, which I'll share with you, um, which is a kind of, um, I don't know how to go up, here we go. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of roundup of all the models I've seen. Um, so I thought maybe I could share it with you and you can pick through and see um, whether any of them are useful to you. It's, for, it's actually from the CSA world, I wrote it for the CSAs, but um, in certain ways, they're more creative in general than the food hubs in how they deal with money. So uh, it's probably quite good to look at their one. I'm just going to talk about one or two of them that I particularly like. Um, so uh, in Stroud, we've got groups, perhaps a bit like Kate's one, where it's about toddlers, it's about community, there's um, cooking going on, there's also jobs advice and that kind of thing. They're community groups, first of all, who are really good. Um, and, and sort of own, owned and controlled in, in the communities where the need is. Um, so what they've done is partnered um, with one of the PFLA farms nearby, pasture-fed farms, that was direct selling um, to quite well-off um, customers, meat. Um, so with Andy Rumming, was the farmer, so he asked his customers if they'd buy another meat box for someone that needs it. But of course, he doesn't know who that is. <laughs> <laughs> and he had all kinds of assumptions about what that kind of person might be like that they couldn't cook or this or that so then there's an intermediary who introduces the two groups and actually gets them to understand each other much better it turns out that they're actually brilliant cooks they know how to make faggots with the offal that he can't sell and so forth so he uses the money that his well-off customers have given him um and the food hub in stroud chooses what they want off his shopping list with the money and then he delivers it to them. And then they're really good at cooking and distributing. So it's a partnership between um, the project that's really good at food and the project that's really good at community and distributing the food. I think those partnerships are quite good. And Stroudco, which is what a member of OFN did something similar. Um, and when we set it up with them, we thought it was good because they'd get actual, they'd get more turnover. They, you know, because the money coming through them would be um, spent with them as well um because the food hub would shop with them but actually they did something quite good they handed over the cash and they didn't require um the community groups to spend the money at Stroudco. um so that was actually very good because then the food poverty groups could do whatever they like with the money and not just buy the food uh, so in the first one it's quite good because the farmer gets the full price for the food um and increases their turnover and the other one is even better from the community's point of view because they can choose to, what they do with the money. So in any case, a partnership between the food trader and um, the group that's actually really good at dealing with the community. Um, so I just wanted to pick out that example. And there's plenty more you know, in this list. And I wanted to just make sure everybody knows about Healthy Start vouchers, which hopefully are going to appear further down. Here we are. Yeah. So I'll share this with you. This has got the link on um, just to make sure you all know about those. That So people, uh, people with young kids on low incomes get these vouchers from the government. The take up's really poor and really, should, you know, the work needs to be done to encourage more people to use them because they're free. And then as a trader, you can register to accept them. Um, and it's quite easy to do. Just click on that link there um, and then you'll get the money for um, and you can sell milk or fruit or veg that way. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knows about that one. Um, uh, 
so yeah i think sliding scales are quite good some of the projects in the um, national peaches work ready healthy heat from doing that and i think people find it a bit easier than pay it forward um so pay, people pay different amounts according to their income so you put different prices on um your sales list according to um whether you're low income middle income or high income and then um overall you end up with the same payments um, but they're spread differently amongst your customers and the other thing I really wanted to pick out was this business about your distribution setup. that if you've got freezers and vans um, and a warehouse and a forklift um, and you're driving about town, um, sometimes what the um, food groups need, the community food groups, is ways to deal with their um, surplus food, that all that distribution set up you've got is exactly what they need to move usually surplus food around so it might not even be that you need to find cash or give away food but somehow to share resources might be a very useful offer and that that's happened quite well and so Stradco is based in it, the same building um, as one of the um, food poverty groups in Stroud and that's yeah that's worked well that's been a win um, I think I'll stop there and I'll just share the document and then you can have a pick through it for other ideas that other people have tried. Thank you, Jade. That's an incredible list. I'm sure lots of people are going to want to get uh, read through that. Um, and yeah, the the highlighting the importance of partnerships is is something really key in food equity, I think. And yeah, so um, I'll pass to to Simon. Thank you. Uh, just to pick up on the partnerships thing, that's been key to to most of the work that we've done is being able to work in partnership with community groups, housing associations, local authorities. Um, Tamar Grow Local has done a variety and continues to do a variety of, of action around food equity. And But I just wanted to pick up on something Jade said. It is never enough. It's never good enough. <laughs> and, uh, the things that we, we've been doing, it's very easy to see their limitations and pick them apart, but we've, we've tried to do the best we can with the resources that we have. So we've done a number of, of things. We started by creating a number of community food projects, which allowed people to engage recreationally in food production, uh, some of which they could, you know, then produce for themselves. Uh, and that also built a kind of groundswell of momentum around local food production, which we, when we started a food hub, uh, hoped to translate into uh, willing customers who would support the local local producers that then supplied the hub and also the community groups that could sell surplus to reduce their their costs and membership fees and such uh, the food hub that we we currently run has uh, um, pretty good support we we sell produce from around 90 different producers and it goes around delivers around the rural area of the Tamar Valley and into the city of Plymouth but the, the projects I, want, I wanted to talk about really have come out of partnerships with organizations in the city of Plymouth. Plymouth has a number of, of a num experiences a number of issues. There was a Fairness Commission report in 2008 which highlighted uh, food and fuel poverty as, as key issues that the city was, was facing. There's a large crescent of multiple community areas in Plymouth that are experiencing multiple, multiple indices of deprivation. And this overlaps very clearly with its the areas of, of um, previous industrial activity that is no longer uh, current. And so, uh, and also Plymouth had a, a large uh, council housing stock, which was pushed over to, uh, to set up a new uh, organization, Plymouth Community Homes, which has 16,000 properties in, in Plymouth and house roughly one in five of the, of the population. So, uh, when Plymouth Community Homes contacted us and said, can you can you do something? Can you come up with a plan to help us engage our tenants in, in food production and, and help change diets to become a bit more healthy? Um, we, we jumped at that opportunity. We, we worked with them to create an action plan. We created various community food initiatives, but that partnership was then uh, in the right place at the right time when the a Cities of Service project came to Plymouth. And that enabled Plymouth City Council to support two larger projects in the city. One of those became Grow Share Cook, which is a project where uh, families are referred to the Grow Share Cook project. They will receive uh, free vegetables on a fortnightly basis uh, and also have the opportunity to, to go to cooking workshops run by another um, 
community interest company called Food is Fun. We started doing that in 2014. Um, and we took a stand early on not to use food surplus. Uh, for our project, it wasn't a good fit. The, we wanted to have something which would be a balanced box to deliver. We wanted also to buy it locally off our local food producers. And the food surplus options that we had at the time, we, we didn't have any kind of um, power over, over what would, would become available through that supply chain. But also the cost, the cost of us going to collect it, store it, and then have to work with it without having any pre-planning time. Um, it was actually cheaper for us to, to purchase premium quality vegetables straight from local producers through our food hub network. And that, that also dovetails really nicely in with a, uh, a farm start project which we run. So our farm start tenants have a, a, an automatic market that we can guarantee to buy from from the Great Share Cook project. So it, it really has got mutual support with other, other elements of Tamar Grow Locals activity. But the vegetables that we uh, purchase then get delivered, uh, packed and delivered to um, folk in Plymouth and uh, cooking workshops are very successful. It was noted early on that it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a lack of skills around cooking that was absent, it was a lack of confidence. And just bringing people together to, to make mistakes together visibly and to, to learn new skills and hints and tips from each other, that was, that was the biggest value for those cooking workshops. At the end of that first two year iteration of the project, we were uh, we had a, a survey which uh, noted that 79% of the respondents said they had a healthier diet as a response of it. But we also had an independent analysis of the social return on investment. And uh, that came out at for every one pound invested in the Grow Share Cook project, it resulted in £15.79 worth of social return, which is quite an incredible number. Um, I'm not sure it's true, but you know, it's good. It's a good project, it's big, <laughs> it's a big number. But um, that was the first iteration over the first two years. And it's been going, it's still going now, but it's changed its focus and funding over the period of years. And from following that, it was funded by the Housing Association and Plymouth City Council directly for a year. After that, the change of focus went to uh, people who'd recently been, been diagnosed with diabetes or living with diabetes. Uh, Plymouth has a, a very large proportion of people relative to the rest of the country who are living with diabetes. And so we were able to mobilize some public health funding uh, to continue this project and the, the cooking workshops that were then organized around uh, controlling diabetes. And then COVID happened and it then continued through COVID uh with the cooking workshops going online uh but using covid response money to to finance the the shopping and uh the project continues it's funded up until april this year we we're not sure what's happening after that but that's one of the things that that we've been running for the last few years aiming to get fresh fresh fruit and vegetables into communities that wouldn't otherwise have access to it access is the big issue in the rural areas it's kind of understandable if if getting to a local shop is difficult because public transport is is just not there and the shops when you when you can get to them do have some fruit and veg but not a full range for little village shops but you kind of think that in a city that's different but famously the part of Plymouth called Ernie Settle you you can't buy fresh carrots in Ernie Settle <laughs> you just can't you have to get a bus or a taxi or uh, a long walk out of that community in order to get to a shop which has fresh vegetables and uh, food hubs that do home delivery are one possible way of doing that but you have to make it financially accessible so we've tried doing that in a couple of ways also and uh, one of those is uh, leveraging the support from our loyal food hub customers that we have so the, the bag of vegetables that are delivered through go share cook project are also available on our food hub and our customers can buy that and add an extra pound on as a donation to the uh, Grow Share Cook project, or they can buy a suspended bag in much the same way as Jade was talking about uh, the, the, the butchery. Uh, you can buy a suspended bag for someone else and that's delivered as part of that project. Uh, and that has allowed us to supply an additional 12 families for fortnightly a year. Um, and that's working quite well. The uh, Housing Association decided to, to not necessarily support the Grow Share Cook project after uh, four or five years and came up with their, their own iteration of that project, 
called New Home, New You, where whenever a new member of, whenever someone moves house and moves into one of their properties, they're given a raft of support because um, it's a good nudge point to change people's lifestyles. One of those uh, things that they're offered is three months supply of vegetables from, from the, the food hub. And uh, so we're able to deliver the, the, the bag of vegetables to them for, for three or six months sometimes uh, as part of that project. The other thing we've tried is rather like the sliding scale thing is to make voucher schemes available where we can have a voucher code that you can put into the OFN system to give you a, a discount uh, across the board. And that, that kind of prioritizes the element of choice from a, from a food hub while still making it financially accessible. And then the delivery system makes it more physically accessible. That, that worked variably. We're hoping to try that again. Um, I think I'm pretty much covering most of what I wanted to say. I'll happily answer questions in a minute. But the, the main thing is nothing is ever enough. And there's always improvements can be, that can be made to these interventions. And uh, there's, there's lots of things that can be done by food hubs, particularly to, to increase accessibility and equity. Thank you, Simon. That was that was great. Um, I think I'd like to move on to to projects and on the kind of the a similar question, but maybe by hearing more about their projects and we'll understand what they're doing in terms of food poverty. So maybe we can start with Sarah and uh, bridging the gap. Great. I was just about to type in the chat. I'm loving all these questions and, and really keen to respond, although caveat is that I don't have the answer, um, but I'm just sort of soaking up uh, the other conversations. And, and I put in the comment, Jada, every time I, I follow you on this, I'm like, these are just like such important points. Anyway, um, I uh, just before I, I launch into my slides, um, I just wanted to go back to where our sustainer is bridging the gap program has come from and I suppose in a way it's come from um sort of personally me listening to these conversations and these issues over the last 10 to 13 years and and, and having worked on community food growing for quite a long time being really passionate about the, the you know the, the role that good food movements and communities can play and that now more recently overseeing our work on sustainable food places seeing the real relevance of local action that we can take so not to to disempower us and what we can do but really thinking a sustained role is about how do we address some of those structural issues how do we stop saying oh this is about you know you getting educated on how to cook with lentils you know or how you know maybe we give everyone a slow cooker and that'll answer the problem you know and I, that's why i really like jade's framing of this is like an inequality crisis um it's it's sharpening some of those structural issues that we know are out there already so so just thinking about it a, a bit from from that context so let me share screen if i can and check i've got, actually got my presentation open a sec um why is that not coming up i'm so smug i didn't test this earlier so uh hold on a minute um okay sorry guys uh when i share screen i get there you go right on it um so bridging the gap as i say built on this like listening and looking and hearing what's been going on in our sector for a long time so we've we're talking we're working with it's a working a bit of a working strap line at the moment and it might change but this is talking about transitioning from food aid to food trade so that we can provide healthy affordable nature and climate friendly food to all um, and at the moment our partners are our lead partners are growing communities who run veg box schemes and have really scaled that out and and spawned a whole you know network of of um Veg boxes and now run the Better Food Traders. If you haven't come across Better Food Traders, do, do look them up again. Another membership organisation that's free to join. And Alexandra Rose, who are coming at it from a different angle. So they're very much coming at it from the Healthy Start. They doubled the Healthy Start vouchers with the use of additional vouchers. They use philanthropy and local authority money to pay for that gap. Um, and they work with um, street markets. Um, and they've got a whole story behind why 
they do that work with street markets. We wanted to bring together that sort of two sides um, and we've got partners in uh, Wales, Two Cents Wales and Nourish Northern Ireland. Um, and I suppose, so I was running a webinar where it was about access to healthy food through convenience stores in areas in London where, you know, we have these urban food deserts. Um, and the people in the chat were asking about whether that produce was organic or, you know, agroecological. And I was sort of like, oh, here we go again, sort of, you know, uh, challenging that the, the sort of, and I thought, you know, for these people that are trying to get healthy food to people on a low income in an urban area, it's hard enough to do that without then thinking about this additional element of, as was it organic or agroecological? And so then we started to think about, well, why is that? Now, at the moment, the, the, the sort of framing of this work is that the, the cost of that, the additional cost, because the cost takes in planetary boundaries and not using excessive cheap chemicals and paying people a proper living wage, um, that food is paying its, its true price. It's more expensive to buy than food that is bad for health and produced in ways that damages the planet. So this is the junk food cycle where it actually becomes more more expensive to do the right thing. So so what we were trying to what we're trying to experiment with with is what happens when you remove that price, because it feels like for all of us working in this sector, we're like pushing water up a hill. You know, uh, it, it it's like you're fighting against that primary barrier all of the time before you get into all the other things that that you all have sort of outlined in your presentations we're fighting with this basic thing that the food system is broken um and that in some ways you know people become you know good or bad in that system um so what is the solution it is most simply simple we want to demonstrate how you can bridge that gap between people on low income and nature and climate friendly food so that everyone can enjoy this, this system and the benefits that brings. So, and I like the way a lot of you have talked about it today. We, we really are up for this experimenting. We really wanna see this as a way of experimenting with what can work and in what situations and to test and learn and adapt what we think need to be scalable interventions and to build the evidence. And I suppose this relates to a question that someone raised, which is, how do you really create that structural change so let's let's not take it for given that that food has to be more expensive subsidy and intervention financial intervention is made by our government all the time all over the place into things that make our economy tick uh and to things that that that, that make our um our big societal values work so what we're saying is where does that money need to go in order to shift this picture so it's quite a big challenge. Um, and I just wanted to show this not finished yet diagram, really, to try and sort of hone in on what we're trying to do with the Bridging the Gap programme. We're not in any way saying that this is all the answers or that the other activities that are going on by the people we're hearing. But what, what we're doing here is we're saying on the one half of our movement, we've got this food access uh, issue, people working really hard to get good food to people on a low income healthy food and um, nutritious food and on the other side you've got nature and climate friendly food people working on localized supply chains but gushing down the middle you've got this river of the broken system and it's creating division in our movement as well as uh, in the real world what we've got in this analogy is this sort of in these stepping stones that we're all trying to make so sliding scales vouchers local interventions one-off pilots we're all heroically trying to get to bridge that gap, but we're sort of stuck in the in the broken system. Um, so what we're looking at is like, how do we take a sort of bigger view of that? What are some of the interventions that we think could be scalable that would lead to some sort of systemic financial policy change that could change the nature and, and could permanently start to bridge that gap? Um, and uh, we, we presented this at the Oxfordville Farming Conference recently, and someone also added into the analogy um, be beavers, which we thought was absolutely fantastic. So I think uh, when we come back to the next section, we'll talk a bit about like how actually we can all, you know, we're building this bigger bridge, but at the same time, we are trying to stem that flow and we are trying to change things from the grassroots up 
Um, so that's in a nutshell. I could go on a, a little bit longer about the about the program, but I don't want to overdo my five minutes. But I, uh, but yeah, I'll leave it there and take up any questions. But that's why you're, the questions that you're putting in that about how do we do the structural stuff? How do we create the policy change? How do we shift this away from what supermarkets do and make the alternative really, really viable are, are all uh, big parts of, of the questions we wanna talk about. Thank you, Sarah. That was, that was great. Um, yeah, really wanna talk about this for hours. And um, okay, so I think we'll go to Angelina. Um, if you want to talk about project or projects or. Yeah, I will do. And I had said I wasn't going to do a PowerPoint, but I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll throw a slide up there for people's easy reference. Um, but uh, yeah, so I will talk about the accessible veg project, which I kind of mentioned when I introduced myself and um, how I got on to the, the theme of making sustainable, healthy food, more accessible to all. Um, so what came out of the tea grains project then was a pilot project around um, making the CSA veg bag scheme more accessible to food insecure households. So it was a small project that kind of kicked off. I put the I put it out into the networks um, looking to work with some farms who would like to test out some solidarity models and get in touch sort of thing. And I was hoping to be able to work with four or five farms. I originally had five farms get in touch. Um, so these farms were spread across Wales. And in the end, four farms uh, sort of moved forward with us on the project. Uh, the fifth farm just felt like they didn't have capacity to engage with the work at this point in time, which which is a very real um, dynamic to consider, you know, the capacity of farms to actually build in solidarity models. So and that kind of leads to some of the points that Jade had made that will I'll raise in a moment. So we worked with these four farms to kind of build the project up. Uh, when these farms got in touch, a lot of them, you know, expressed the concern that they didn't, they wanted to be growing vegetables that was available for everyone in their community. This was really important to all of the farm partners. And, you know, through the COVID pandemic, and then so we hadn't had the cost of living crisis yet, but through the COVID pandemic, what they had seen is a portion of their membership who were no longer able to afford to be a part of their membership scheme because their their working situation had changed, their incomes had changed, and that was one of the areas where they were forced to cut back. And um, different farms kind of dealt with this in different ways. Um, and that's what then got them into thinking about more structured solidarity models. So with the research project, which I think, you know, can become a model for how this might be approached on a bigger scale, we made the funding available for the first year to pay for all of the veg bags for the food insecure households that participated. And in some ways, what that created was it, it reduced the risk for farms to experiment with different solidarity approaches and to work out a what approach works for them, but also b how many households could they support then um, in a financially sustainable way going forward without project support. So it became a sort of no risk approach to implementing solidarity models. Um, and you know, the project kind of evolved as we went along and ideas were developed um, at an early stage. It came up in discussions about part because it was a challenge. Well, how do we how do we reach food insecure households? How do we recruit households to participate in in this work. And that was then where through discussions we realized actually let's partner up with organizations that are working with food insecure households. And then through those organizations, we can gain that access. And these organizations, they understand who in the community would benefit from, from this kind of access. And um, so of the four farm partners, we had two of them who were able to form really good relationships with a uh, organization um, that was working with food insecure households. One farm wasn't able to find anyone to work with and the fourth farm had a kind of strange relationship uh, with the council. And so what we 
just skipping to kind of what the outcome from the project. So over one harvest season, we interviewed households at the start and we interviewed households at the end of that um, season. And we saw that, as you would expect, food insecurity was reduced over that period of time. Um, but what we were really interested in was the non-food benefits that we saw coming out of the project. And one of those was the improvements in well-being that households, that participants experienced. Um, so that was an improvement of about 10 percent, roughly. Um, and one of the things that really came out from that was that impact of relationships. Uh, this was what kind of got me onto the subject in the in the very first place was looking at what happens when we build relationships back into the food system and what we could see with these food insecure households that one of the benefits of that was improvement in well-being. And the interesting thing, because you think that the relationship has to happen face to face, that it's because people are meeting the farmer, getting these veg that you have these relationships building. But actually what we saw is relationships happen in a lot of different ways. And actually much of that can happen in a digital format or even through just the newsletters that were put into the veg bags on a weekly basis. Uh, because we had 70% of the participants said that they felt connected with the farm, but 60% of the participants had never visited the farm. So, I mean, that's quite interesting. You know, 60% had never even been on the farm, yet they felt connected with what the farm was doing. And, and that happened through different forms of communications that were happening online through the social media and also through the letters, but also through that weekly regular sustained contact with the drop off of the veg um, be, because particularly for food insecure households a lot of the contacts and interactions that they have with the outside world tend to be quite stressful they tend to be negative and there's a demand placed on them Whereas here's a sort of weekly positive point of interaction. They're getting this bag of veg. The person asks them, how are you doing? You know, there's no demands on them. And it was actually um, something that a number of participants commented on. It was a real high point for them on a weekly basis. And, and the farms were really surprised that when we were talking with one of the farm partners, the um, woman who made the deliveries every week, she was really surprised. She said, but you know, I only chatted with there for five, 10 minutes, but, you know, just the sort of overwhelming positive um, experience of that interaction really came through. So I guess it's just thinking about as a sort of take home point, that power of relationships and that there's more, there's many ways that you can build those relationships. And then thinking about the as others have said, the role of partnerships. And it was the farms that had that had strong partnerships in place that were able to engage most successfully with the solidarity model and to main and to retain the households who joined at the start of the project through to the end of the season. So I'll leave it there, but there's loads more you can read about um, in the report if it sounds of interest. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's that's very, very interesting. Um, and I'm sure people have questions. Um, I'll let Electra go next. Um, hi there. Um, yeah, thank you all. That's been super great to listen to all of that. And I think I'm probably going to be sending you all emails um, asking for your different advice on different things. Um, but I'm just going to share my screen to show you a couple of slides. Um, can you see that okay? Yeah. Cool, great. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm just trying to move things around. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to speed through um, this just to give you a small overview, and I really hope it's not going to be too repetitive from what others have already said. Um, but yeah, so a little bit of an introduction to my research. The working title of my thesis at the moment is Minding the Gap, Who's Responsible? An Exploration into the Ways Grassroots Networks are Cultivating Food Justice. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm kind of really interested in this question of who is responsible. Um, and that kind of 
plays into a whole load of questions about this subject. Um, and I've spoken a little bit about what the gap is. Um, so on the one hand, food produced in agroecological ways, um, and then on the other hand, the accessibility of that food. Um, and as others have said, um, accessibility extending far beyond simply its affordability, um, but into the more social, cultural and political spheres. Um, and again, also considering the physical accessibility um, people have to these products. Um, and so who's taking responsibility for bridging this gap? And I don't wanna make two sweeping statements, but it feels increasingly that governments aren't taking responsibility for that. Um, and that the kind of reality of the economic crisis trumps action at the moment. Um, so instead, we're kind of increasingly reliant on the unofficial local and national welfare system. Um, and then, so to introduce a little bit about the Community Resilience Fund, um, which was devised by the Independent Food Aid Network, the Community Supported Agricultural Network, and the Land Workers Alliance, um, who collectively coordinated a funding bid from the National Lottery and Farming Futures Fund um, with the intention to fund pilot projects testing and illustrating how funding to small farms, market gardens and community food growing projects can improve access to good food for all. Um, and again, kind of Sarah mentioned this, that the project was really intended to kind of, for it to be really trial um, to try loads of different projects and kind of see what worked and see what didn't. So kind of all the failures from these projects have been really important to kind of learning um, what works and what doesn't. Um, and then just to, the project was also devised during one of the first lockdowns and ran for a year and um, kind of from 2021 and into 2022. Um, so who received the funding from the Community Resilience um, Fund? In total, 36 projects across England, Wales and Scotland were funded. Um, each project received £10,000 to run their pilot um, with the intention of finding ways to connect producers with people to improve access to good food for those experiencing household insecurity. Um, other kind of key aims of it um, were kind of moving away from charity um, towards solidarity. And then also empowering the recipients of food aid and in trying to incorporate these people into the management of these projects. Um, and really broadly, I've categorized projects into different groups. Um, so 16 commercial farms or market gardens were funded. And these are kind of broadly businesses that are financially dependent on the produce that they grow and sell. And then 13 community gardens or kind of other types of gardens were funded. Um, and these are more organisations that aren't necessarily dependent on the produce grown. Um, they might be volunteer led, um, they might have kind of specific educational elements or other community outreach um, aspects of their project. Um, but generally they're not reliant or they're reliant on other streams of funding. Um, and then community organisations, four of these were funded um, again, these aren't necessarily growing projects, but um, kind of community kitchens, food hubs, and again, generally reliant on other streams of funding. And then there were three other projects funded, um, one of which was a catering company. Um, and the lines that I've drawn between these projects are in ways kind of arbitrary, um, because I don't think the projects kind of fit neatly into each of those um, groups, and that's partly because we're seeing more and more within growing projects that people are having to stack enterprises to make them work. Um, and just a couple of examples of the different kinds of projects that were developed and coordinated. So um, people created community gardens within existing sites or kind of completely new um, community gardens on disused land. Um, the introduction of solidarity or sliding scale models, which has been discussed quite a bit. Um, and then projects that collaborated with food banks or other community food growing projects and um, projects focused around training and education and growing food. Um, and then some that were focused um, on access to culturally appropriate and relevant foods as well. Um, and then, so just briefly to kind of speed through some of the intentions and emerging themes that came that's come out of it. Um, so, 
I think many of these projects were successful at moving away from food aid and toward alternative models, though I think many projects later questioned if they were best placed to address the root causes um, that led to food insecurity. And likewise, some projects struggled to achieve the potential impact as they didn't have the means to address um, the initial barriers to participation in the project. Um, and then this kind of leads into a reoccurring theme that comes up, um, particularly among commercial market gardens. And I think there's been mention of this in the chat of just that the capacity of market gardens is already so, so stretched and making the business economically viable within the current food system is sometimes feels kind of impossible. So I think some people expressed that they'd overestimated they'd the time they'd have to dedicate this work and that led to kind of feel difficult feelings about the project um, or like a sense that they weren't doing enough or that they weren't able to achieve enough because their capacity was so limited. So again, asking are these projects best suited for that work? Um, and then also, I guess, because this produce is largely seen as being quite inaccessible um, and people had existing market bases. So then accessing people or recruiting um, people into the initial stages of this project was a lot more time consuming and challenging than people had expected. Um, and that was really a process of kind of building trust within their communities. Um, and kind of, I think these projects offer a real snapshot into what could be done going forward. And it's clear from the research that to build projects that are really sustainable, they need longer time and continuous funding. Um, I think also it's important to mention that funding can be a major barrier to projects um, when there's lots of hoops and layers of paperwork to jump through and um, that can be a real challenge and then also having to sometimes conform to the kind of ideals of the funders um, can be problematic and should be kind of we should be aware of that too um, and then finally another theme coming out um, has been the expectations placed on kind of particular groups to do this kind of work um, and some have expressed that they felt external pressure to deliver work with a social impact, but in, sign, but in kind of hindsight, it felt that these issues were way bigger than them. Um, and likewise, many had got into this line of work out of a real kind of interesting commitment to food justice, but um, were acknowledging that trying to make their businesses viable was kind of hard enough. So they were, they were kind of competing with a real desire that doing this work was was kind of what made it all meaningful um but actually running businesses within kind of our broken food system is such a challenge in and of itself um and perhaps i'll kind of leave it there so to not be repetitive of anyone else um but yeah thank you thank you so much electra that's that was very very interesting um and okay, I think uh, we'll move on to question three and we'll try to keep it a little bit brief because I've seen that there's some really interesting questions in the chat. Um, but the, the next question is, what do you think needs to happen to achieve food equity in the UK? And is there anything you would suggest those here today can do to make a difference in their own communities? And as I like to say, I mean, small acts of resistance are actually quite important. So I would love to hear from you and maybe we can start with Kate. Hi, yeah, um, I, I totally agree with that. Um, small acts of resistance. Um, what we found is that it's really, really important um, like to establish your stakeholders with, with all of this you know who who are they um what what do people want um do people want to be rescued and give given food or do they you know do they want to actually um be engaged within it and the more autonomy that that your community has with what you are doing the more they are involved the more they're empowered and the more they are taking ownership of it um i think the more powerful it is um 
anyone who's thinking about doing this again don't reinvent the wheel there's some fantastic toolkits out there the sustain toolkit is fantastic we've been using that and um, working on that thank you sarah it's brilliant um but again you know we've, we've been linking in with local groups who are already established so the one thing that's really important to remember is that people are time poor it's not that they don't want to do this it's not that they don't want to eat healthily it's not they don't want all of these things but if you've worked a 15 hour shift and you've got young children and you're struggling for money and you've just walked in the door you don't necessarily want to come and volunteer in a garden so we offer family friendly um workshops activities and and people can come and eat we we have the um the half clubs in the in the holidays where um children come to us so it's, it's like, kind of like childcare, you know um and they they literally pick the food tend the garden grow their own food and eat on the spot they don't have to take it home and cook um they cook for their parents when their parents have finished work or whatever and come to pick them up um or not finish work you know come, come to pick them up they can sit and eat food that their children have grown and, and prepared for them and the more examples that we have of this and of this working of these little pockets of resistance of these little pushbacks of these communities coming together around food I think it's a little bit naive to say you know no one's ever going to go to the supermarket again because we are all time poor there are things like dog food and nappies that we can't grow we can't keep people out of supermarkets but it's just really important to establish this um this need um in the community to to regrow around around food and, and food systems um and i think that would that would be my main advice yeah establish your stakeholders and and and, and use the toolkits connect build a network and 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 show show that it can work and that it can work well thank you kate um okay i'll pass to to jade um I, i've only got sticking plaster answers sorry about that <laughs> uh do something about rural food poverty you it's absolutely grim uh being poor in a rural area and nearly all the food poverty work is urban do something about rural food poverty if you can uh if you're a food hub um Oh, this is a bit boring and obvious, but you might be better placed than anyone else to start thinking about new sources of surplus food. It's obviously totally not OK that people on low incomes are being given surplus food, but actually that is what's happening. So we might as well do it well for now. Um, so if you're a few time collecting food from various traders, uh, gather up all their surplus food um, and give it to someone who can make use of it. Like Here we found... The abattoir was uh, giving all the offal to um, pet food, which the food, food poverty group would never have known that. We knew that because we we're killing sheep. Um, so uh, or, or we just go around the farmers, the farmers market at the end of the trolley and collect all the leftovers from the farmers market. It's a ton of food that was just getting wasted because they stopped trading at two o'clock on Saturday and then they're not open on a Sunday um, and take that. So, so you're well placed probably to do better with getting better quality surplus food into the system it's terrible sticking plaster sorry <laughs> and i think maybe we better come back to um ben and d we've forgotten all about them <laughs> you should have been here speaking uh there they are um so um i i, I you know we we asked them this kind of question what should be happening um and they talked about their experience of the project they're 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 a kind of a success story i don't really like presenting success stories it's what funders want to hear and it's what organizations want to talk about but the reality is actually people's health or mental health or financial issues are really ongoing they're lifelong and uh you get three years funding and actually you don't change people's lives it's and you know it's it's not even a sensible premise to begin with but anyway here's a success story um so this is what they had to say um, I wonder if I can make this look a bit nicer as a slideshow. I think I probably can. There we go. No, I can't. Go down. Where are they? Ooh. There they are. Um, so, so this is what their key worker said, uh, Ben, about those two um, young people. I'll let you just read it for yourself. So if they were here, they might give that kind of answer. 
Um, and you'll see they don't mention, I thought that uh, we were funding them to do a food poverty project that has something to do with nutrition and sustainable food, <laughs> which they don't mention at all. Uh, so I think maybe uh, uh, what you can do is really, you know, and other people have said the same people have been talking about chatting, they've been talking about swimming, they've been talking about housing and housing associations, they've been talking about discos, um, all that other stuff um, you can do. That wasn't a very good answer, but that's yeah, best I could come up with, I'm afraid. It's quite hard to fix. <laughs> no, yeah, it's definitely really hard. Um, but thank you. And I'll pass to um, Angelina. Yeah, so I think, you know, it's about growing the social movement, all of these acts of resistance, but also all of these sort of community scale projects that are really building the evidence base of, of what works and sort of it becomes the evidence base for systemic change via policy. And I know that this is really a strong focus within the sustain project. And, you know, you've got to see, you've got to prove what works before you can try to change policy. I know there's a question in the chat around policy and absolutely it's critical. And I am I know I'm also working a lot in the Welsh context around food policy um, and interested, you know, the latest, uh, the Good Food Act in Scotland now, and um, just trying to motivate those change in terms of a food systems approach to policy. Um, I think, you know, if we move beyond the sticking plaster, it does get very big very quickly because I think at the root of it uh, is the sort of housing costs cost of housing has gone up so much over the last 40, 50 years that um, while the cost of food has gone down, we have far less money available every month to actually pay for food because we're having to pay so much towards housing costs. Um, but I think, you know, co-production within the community is really critical. I think that document you shared, Jade, is fantastic showing all of uh, the, not all, but uh, a really long list of different kinds of actions that you can take to make food more accessible just kind of illustrates how um, it's different approaches in different contexts that's going to work best and that's sort of best determined by the community working together in partnership and this was a really big point that Kate made I think at the very beginning it's about bringing the community together because again it's the relationships and um like what you were just saying um a moment ago jade it, they they weren't talking about food they were talking about all of these other activities and i think of those as the non-food benefits that sort of came out of the food project. It's, you know, the connections that are being made, that confidence, self-esteem, the the other activities then and the well-being that results from that. So it's just, you know, it's a system, it's all connected. And I think, you know, in all these different ways that we can, we have to be pushing forward the conversation, the actions to build up that evidence base to get that sweeping systemic change that that we really need so that we move beyond the sticking plasters. But I don't think it's just sticking plasters. It's we're we're working towards something here. That's that's my optimistic belief. <laughs> no, I, I like that answer. I think we need to be a little bit optimistic sometimes. Um, but it's true. I I I really like how you've all said that partnership and bringing in the community, it's, it's so important. Um, okay, um, I'll pass to Simon. Thank you. Uh, what can we do locally? For me, I think it's about uh, being very pragmatic and strategic with the resources that you have to hand. Uh, if, if you're presented with only sticking plaster projects, then perhaps the best thing to do is to look to how you can join them together so that the legacy from one uh, adds to the, the, the effectiveness of the next project, or if they're running concurrently, they can be mutually supportive. And I think by joining things together, you can create a, a constellation of projects happening locally that can be greater than their individual uh, impact. Um, people talk about enterprise stacking. I, I prefer constellations because it really does then, uh, that metaphor brings in the ecology of 
the stacking projects, the, the stacking maybe doesn't. So the relationships between things. And I think food hubs are best placed to make those kinds of, uh, to be the, the spine of those kinds of constellations. They are the, the hub that all these projects can feed into and draw resources from. So a food hub can have a voucher scheme, can support a farm start project, can support local CSAs, can be the delivery arm and the distribution system uh, for a number of producers to, to help them and make their businesses more viable, but also increase the physical accessibility into, into food deserts, both rurally and in the city. Um, and they can have pay it forward schemes, which can um, deliver in rural areas as well as urban ones and, and can take with the pay it forward money that we get from, in, from the Food Hub and Tamar Grow Local is, is our money. It's not dictated what we spend on it. Uh, by a funder so we can prioritize where those things go and we we support the the rural food hub the rural food banks in Callington and Tavistock with those projects where it's difficult to get funding to support rural areas so uh the food hub I think is the is the backbone of a constellation of projects that can, can happen locally thank you Simon um I'll pass to uh Electra Um, hi. Um, yeah, I think, I guess it, I find it really easy to get very um, overwhelmed and um, thinking about the change that we need. And um, there was something that someone said to me, or I, one of my questions, because my research has been kind of focused on the motivations of people that do this work, not on the people necessarily at the receiving end of this work. And um, one of my questions had been around how they um, navigate that space of scale when it feels like their work is very kind of small and immediate in their communities. And someone had said a nice proverb, which was large streams from little fountains flow and tall oaks from little acorns grow. Um, and I think it's, I think we do kind of have to really um, constantly remember that like this change is not gonna be quick. Um, and that it's really going to take um, two, this kind of two pronged approach um, where grassroots action and kind of community local action serves as the kind of evidence for bigger policy change. Um, and then I guess with all of that, I think it's also really important. Again, it's easy to get and I it happens to me all the time where I get completely disenchanted by the system and by thinking about this all at large. But I think it's really important to kind of dream big with this stuff and to really ask the hard questions and kind of really consider what something like, I don't know, universal basic income, which was specifically for food, what that might actually look like. Um, how might we demand the right to food be enshrined in law? Um, what might kind of a real food education actually look like and so just kind of keep asking those questions um which I know is <laughs> a lot easier said than done so um but yeah I mean I think also conversations like these are really important and there's lots of exciting work whether or not it's a sticking plaster whether or not it's moving towards bigger change I I think it's kind of all of those things um yeah thank you Thank you. No, I think I, I agree. I think we should look at it from various different angles, big and small. And yeah. Um, okay, I'll pass to Sarah. Um, thank you. And I mean, just, you know, yeah, wow, what amazing sort of suggestions to, to build on and, and sort of pull together. I think that um, I sort of totally get the disenchantment with, you know, disillusionment with policy work. And I think that uh, we we have to carry on bang, banging that drum and looking for those structural issues, um, but at the same time, you're you're you are doing the right thing. You're here. You're having a conversation about it. You're thinking about it. You're listening about. You're listening to to what can be done. You're beavering away and helping us to build those like dams. And as Simon, you know, Simon, you're saying, you know, pulling that all together. If you've got lots of people beavering away, that we can start to build this from the ground up. We're also seeing sort of almost subversive policy change happen at a local level through local governments, things like 
um, junk bans on junk food advertising, you know, that would never get national policy, but we're seeing, you know, local authorities like under the radar start to do this work. So that's quite exciting. So we can be part of this sort of underground movement, always almost operating uh, under the radar. But I would say, what can we do? Um, you know, building on Jade's stuff about changing narratives. This is about challenging ourselves around what language we use. I hate the idea that organic regenerative food is seen as a middle class luxury. Um, people, people have values regardless of their income. Whether they can live those values out is a second is another thing. So why shouldn't we have aspirations um, where everyone has a universal right? So as Electra is saying, think big. Why can't we have a universal right to this sort of food? Um, and why can't we come behind a call for that? Even if it feels like it's pie in the sky at the moment, we have to start with that vision somewhere. Um, and after all, we are in a climate and nature emergency is what we keep you know, hearing. So when are we going to actually start to see action on that? Um, on a practical level, I would say talk to someone else. Talk to someone outside of your comfort zone, partner with someone that thinks differently to you. Um, that's stuff that Jade was saying or someone else was saying about, you know, people that understand work in these communities. Um, embrace failure, like try some stuff out. If it doesn't work, we've, we've got to get better at that. Um, and I think even the funders are starting to understand that, uh, particularly the funders that we're funded by National Lottery, and, and they seem to be getting that that's part of our learning, is learning to fail and learning what doesn't work. I think building the movement and being part of the conversation, um, we we really want to do that in Bridging the Gap. We really want to get away from sort of re reinforcing our own bias and our own assumptions and widening that out. Um, I, I would also say, you know, this is the art of like what possibilism, what's possible, why not? Why, you know, asking that question, why not? Why can't we do that? Um, and then on a very practical level, I would be saying, you know, pay the living wage, Think about the structure of your organisations um, and are you embedding those values in the way that, that you work and, and you deliver? Um, so, yeah. And, yeah, just yeah, carry on joining these conversations. Thank you so much, Sarah. And, yeah, I do agree. We have to keep joining these conversations and it's a shame that it's almost over. We only have five minutes left. Um, but thank you so much to, to you, Angelina, Sarah, Simon, Electra, Kate, and Jade for joining us today. That was amazing. And I'm sure everyone really enjoyed that. Um, and there's some really, really interesting comments in the chat. And I've seen that you've been responding. Um, I think we can take one question and maybe end after that. Um, but if you're pressed with time, we can also finish now as you want. I don't know what do you think, Kay. I reckon we could go to one of the questions in the chat. Um, maybe Alex's question. Do you want me to? Shall I read it? Shall I read it out? And there was two comments. There's two questions in the chat. Um, so just with the time we've got left, if that's okay, maybe we could go to Alex Kearney's question. What opportunities are there to influence local, regional, or national policy to address systematic inequality, systemic inequality in our food system? And are any panelists seeking to change policy at the moment? I feel like there's been quite a lot of talk about that already. So is anyone from the panelists would love to jump in on that? Angelina, did I see you waving your hand? Yeah, yeah, I can jump in quickly. Just say in the Welsh context, um, at the moment, we've got the Wales, the Food Wales Bill that's making its way through the Assembly. And that is really about putting a food systems approach to policy in place, building a national vision for what our food system should look like, co-producing that from the bottom up, and then using that to drive targets that different ministries the different um, ministers are responsible for meeting, building that into local food plans that are driven by the local authorities. I mean, there's a lot of stuff, really good stuff in there. At heart of it, it's about healthy, sustainable, accessible foods. So um, this is stuff that I've been sort of personally consulting on and trying to drive forward and making sure a they don't dilute it and b that it actually gets through um the next vote in welsh assembly so i think it's an exciting moment in time that we're in there's a lot of stuff happening in the policy and legislation space in the devolved context i think england's a bit behind on that um but I think, you know, if the other devolved nations are driving this conversation, perhaps at some point England will catch up 
with it. I mean, the national feed strategy put forward a lot of really good stuff. Um, we see the government not really giving that any attention. Um, we know both Labour and Conservatives don't really see food as um, high on their agendas, but um, hopefully the devolved nations can kind of drive that conversation at least and, and make the change. Thank you, Angelina. And Jayla, I see you've put your hand up. So just with this precious time, have you got- I'll enough? say it quickly. Yeah, I've given up trying to do policy work. So I respect the people who are still doing it. I'm in England and I've no, lost the will. Um, but uh, the thing I did want to say was that I think we haven't done enough about working with the people who are using the community food projects to voice their own outrage and to um, for themselves to- uh, experience what's wrong in their lives as a structural problem rather than a personal problem for, for something about helping people using the food poverty projects to um themselves shout about why this has happened brilliant thank you jade um sarah i've just seen you put your hands up i think we've got time for you to give an answer thank you i mean just say yes we are doing loads on it at Sustain and through the Sustainable Food Places Network. Um, sustainable Food Places in particular are saying, well, how can we lever what's happened in the Good Food Bill in England and what are the opportunities with a sort of election and, and manifestos coming up? So can we actually get Labour to, to put this stuff in um, at the moment? You know, that we're not saying we're winning that, but we're definitely working on it. It's also like what other sort of policy influences food? So how do we influence planning policy? Um, how, you know, how do we look at assets and, and who has access to land and other assets of interest? How do we use things like, you know, levelling up funding and, and to influence those? So you know, I think there there are wins that we are, are working on and working towards. And I think um, even even if it's a slow and slum, sometimes frustrating and sometimes, you know, we go backwards. For, so, for example, looking at procurement and looking at the national standards, of the government, you know, again, that's been delayed. But we're just not, you know, like it's like we're, we're the dogs with the bone. We're not letting up. So we can't let government um, off the hook and, and to think that we can't stop, even if we it doesn't feel like we're always winning it. But I think Jade is, is totally right in that that we do need to sort of find our voice as a movement. And I think that's why we need to bridge this divide because I think if we're coming at it always from a slightly different angle, then our, our voice is somewhat diluted. So we're really hoping um, that we can help help to bring people's, people behind sort of a, a much more uniform. And we're seeing that people like land workers are doing a fantastic job at sort of unifying that part of the movement. So, we, you know, then we've got the traders in the middle, so you guys better food traders, and then we've got those sort of activists on the ground doing stuff in terms of food poverty. So like, what a fantastic movement to bring together. So uh, yeah, let's hope we, we can continue. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. What a fantastic movement. Thank you so much to all of the panelists uh, today. Um, just to follow up on that, we're actually gonna be organizing a round table in February, which will be more like an open discussion around this very same topic um so stay tuned to the open food network socials if you'd like to join us for that so that's going to be more of a kind of interactive conversation to follow this up as well as following this up with a blog where we'll get to maybe some more of the questions that that were missed um also i've just put in the chat a link to a feedback form and uh, it would really help us um, if you've got any feedback for us today on the session how it went any improvements um we'd be really grateful and yeah, um, we're two minutes past. Sorry about that, panelists. It's late. It's eight. I bet you're dying to get off. Are you going to export the chat? It's just there's a couple of things in there that would be helpful to pick up on. Yeah, that's um. So we're going to share. Actually, that's a very good point. Um, for anyone that got their ticket through Eventbrite, which I think should be everyone, we're going to share the chat and the recording um to this session within the next week. Um, then we'll be following up with the blog and posting this um recording onto YouTube so you can access it there. But the chat won't be shared on YouTube or anything so it's got some people I think it's got emails in which might be sensitive so that will be shared in a if everyone if that's okay with everyone if that's not okay just drop a note in the chat that you don't want to be contacted with um, a transcript of the chat um because we'll send it to everyone's emails who um joined us on Eventbrite and all the panelists so that will be shared afterwards so we don't lose all of the amazing comments there um which were great awesome thank you so much Jenna for facilitating thank you so much for everyone that came um and hopefully see you all again in February for a roundtable on this um, and continue the conversation on this really important topic. So, yeah, a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, bye. Thank you.
I 